So I'm Nick Gardner. Um, yeah, I know most of you. Um, so I had a book come out. Um, when did your book come out? My book. Yeah, yours came out. Late April. Okay. February for you. February. Yeah. So we basically got connected through a mutual friend and um, decided that we should do an event together in DC. And Andrew Bertana joined on, which many of you know. Um, so um, I noticed that we all write about work in different ways, so I thought that would be a cool thing to talk about a little more in depth. Um, so basically I'm just going to introduce Andrew and then he's going to kind of take it away. We'll do, each do um, a short reading and then Andrew has some questions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Andrew Rutina is the author of the essay collection, The Body is a Temporary Gathering Place, and the short story collection, One Person Away From You. His work has appeared in the Three Penny Review, Witness Magazine, Post Road, and elsewhere. His work has been anthologized in the Best American Poetry, the Best American Microfiction, and listed as notable in three editions of the Best American Essays. He has an MFA from American University, so he writes everything. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, okay. Um, welcome. I am going to. Um, I'm going to read um, a little bit uh, from the beginning, and then I'm going to introduce each of these writers, and you guys will give a little bit of a reading. Um, uh, but I'm going to quote a little thing that Nick had, because actually I, I found it uh, really useful. Um, in his essay, Get a Job, Benjamin Percy states that your way of seeing the world bends around your work. Percy goes on to give an example of a farmer whose sense of time depends on the height of corn, whose sense of place is created by the fields that surround him. Um, and I think it's something that's actually, uh, for some reason, easy to forget. And I can think of how radically altered my life is by the job that I had working in a library versus the job as a university professor. Um, it really changes the way that I interact and think about the world. And yet, I don't know, I feel like it sometimes goes under discussed in fiction, so I think it's actually um, an exciting topic. Um, so I will start by introducing Nick. Um, Nick Gardner is a writer, critic, writing teacher, and beer and wine buyer. His books include So Marvelously Far from Crisis Chronicle Press, An Accounting of Addiction and Recovery in the Rust Belt, Hurricane Trinity from Unsolicited Press, a climate change novella and linked story collection, and delinquents and other escape attempts from Madrona. He's received support from the Elizabeth George Foundation, Vermont Studio Center, the DeGroote Foundation, and DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. He lives in Ohio and Washington, DC. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna read a quick bit from my uh, story, Psychedelicious, out of my new book. By the time Alan fired up the grill at the Great Midwest Beer Fest, we were already food truck experts. Smash burger virtuosos, burrito hot shots, savants of kimchi slaw. When I glanced out the service window, the crooked queue of beer enthusiasts stretched beyond the K-Rader tents, proving psychedelicious street food's weird allure. Alan told me who doesn't like beer and greasy grub. What could go wrong? A culmination of his batshit dreams and our grueling effort of nights where Alan killed his beard and hit the hay, leaving me to soak and scrub the dishes alone. This was success, and we shared the pride between us. What could go wrong, I wondered, when Alan always won? A question I, the loser, could not properly ponder. We traded food for sample wars from Dad Bod Beer, the festival's host. Their brews named things like Double Dry Hopped Daydream, Terpene dream. Live bands droned from the stage in the meadow and heads swarmed with woozy vibes. I told the customers it was a 20 minute wait. 25, 30, Alan said catch up. I mangled a name barely audible above the psych rock background in and passed the paper tray to the appropriate hungry hands. My mouth was dry, so I tipped the last sip of beer foam and felt wings fumble around my mouth before the stinger pierced my tongue. I screamed and the wasp missled out, undamaged. The taco tray hit the ceiling, and I lurched into Alan. His palm sizzled on the grill. We spun, tumbled, collided, the space too tight to dance out of one another's way. He said, what the fuck? I said, boo-boo, boo-boo. <laughs> the swinging slap box of Alan's hands, the dodge and mumble of my swelling face. Okay, next up, um, we have Tobias Carroll. Tobias Carroll is the author of five books, 
Most recently, the novel in this site, his 2020 book, Political Sign, was released as part of the Object Lesson series. He writes a monthly column about translated books for Words Without Borders and is the managing editor of Volume 1 Brooklyn. Look, thanks, all. thanks everybody. Thanks for moderating. Thanks for hosting. Um, this is a new book. It's, uh, it's, it's a speculative road novel about a guy who is into illegally modifying people's brains, uh, which is a not career choice to have and backfires on our hero in many uh, ways that threaten his life, livelihood, and uh, health. Uh, this is a very quick segment from here, uh, kind of explaining where we are. This was how it went. Farrier and his two cohorts made their madcap secret society, and then they discovered the product. They'd gotten into varied things, most notable among them, body modification for purposes of mood modification. If you had the right gear, you could solder together something to control a mild electrical current to the brain of whoever was connected to it and, ostensibly, lead them to a point wherein they no longer felt such a pronounced sadness. They'd gotten into that in college. Others enjoyed MDMA or weed or drugs more pernicious. For them, it was about the science. And the bliss, of course. But it was a scientific sort of bliss, absolutely. Science in your bliss or bliss in your science. Who could deny the appeal of that? This was how it went. Farrier and Lopez and Erskine, researching all sorts of things and assembling chemical cocktails and endeavoring to rewire their own head spaces. Erskine even got a grant for some of it, which impressed the two, the other two, to no small extent. This work continued for several years, long past their collegiate beginnings. They had a small warehouse and a small salaried cohort. They worked within their means. This was how it went. The time Farrier wondered about neurology, about case studies of people whose personalities had changed radically after some sudden and possibly traumatic event. And the time Lopez looked into questions of random number generation, and if there wasn't some possible way that the brain could be utilized to reflexively generate a random number around which some structure could be built. And the time Erskine's fieldwork led him to substances that destabilized certain parts of the mind, a whole body of research surrounding that. And the time Erskine spoke of a friend with severe depression who wanted simply to be someone other than themselves. And the time Lopez spoke of the properties of cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnosis and the science behind how they worked. And the time when Farrier stayed up far too late one night, poking and prodding at certain compounds and greeted his partners in the morning, the two of them well rested and Farrier haggard yet ecstatic. Farrier grinning, Farrier saying, I think I've got something. This was how it went, the realization that a compound, a substance, a drug that effectively turned you into someone else was probably not the sort of thing that was viable from a commercial standpoint, nor was it legal. Still, that was how it began. And now Farrier was all that was left of it, never skint, but always solitary. A compound, a substance, a drug, a product. His product, and his circuit to deliver it. This was always eloquent.
The trapper then pushed in the safety lever and pulled the door open. Out soon the squirrel, sometimes after a moment or two of hesitation. Sometimes the squirrel needed some coaxing, some assurance that life wasn't about to end with a lever crashing down on, on its head. Often you'd see the squirrel wait a few seconds, its panting, heaving breast surging up and down, the tail cocked and ready for anything. Alarm sounds escaping from its mouth, the door to freedom was open, the squirrel bolted. Most times the squirrel darted through the grass and pounced upon the first waiting tree. It looked back from the base of the tree trunk and continued its climb into the high ridges of the branches where the leaves disguised its movements. Sometimes they stopped and looked back. They spied the trapper, let go of the open trap door, picking up the empty cage. Wild releases always felt good, capturing the beast and removing it from someone's house. Mission accomplished. It was now free to roam, run the tops of trees, or settle down into the nook of an old tree trunk. Then it would gather its acorns and rubbish through garbage and avoid the dogs on park walls. I liked the ones who looked back with a gleam in their eye. At one moment, life was sealed shut, and existence was waiting for the flood or the pain of the door being slammed down forcefully on one's head. The next moment, a portal was lifted, and there was hyperventilation until nerves sent it scurrying through the doorway and out into freedom. Every now and then, the squirrel looked back and was grateful for a second chance, and another tree, another park. I jotted down everything Dad said. Equipment, baiting, placement, setting the trap, removing the trap, releasing the squirrel. Everything was there. So, how about if we include an example from your past, my boy, of what not to do? A little comic relief in this essay. Oh man, I forgot all about that. <laughs> well, let me refresh my, your memory. So my dad did, and here's how it went. A squirrel was in the back of the truck. We forgot about it, honestly. One time we did that, the poor thing froze to death in the truck. This frantic guy had waited for hours. We took him out of the house in five towns, Rockway, worked all day, and were hidden home. Right before we pulled up, I remembered him, so we turned around and went back to Marine Park. The squirrel's nose was torn from his assault on the cage. He dug red tracks through his fur and skin from the back and forth assault on the metal bars. Frantically, he knocked the cage from side to side. Guttural sounds emanated from the back of the truck. He was pissed and scared. We pulled up to Marine Park. Dad was beaten, checking messages. He motioned for me with his head to do the release. I went to the back, took the cage out gingerly. The squirrel banged the cage furiously, and I nearly dropped it twice. This guy made the business. I saw the terrified look in his eyes. He rattled the cage, but I held the top hand of tight with my trembling club fingers. His stomach heaved and he made intense warm pulse. I saw his heart beating through his fur with every lunge of the metal cage. Dad always grabbed the cage bars freely with his calloused hands. He never worried about a scratch or a bite. His knuckles were nicked and his hands were hardened by 40 years of work. The grunt stopped as I swung the cage forward. The heaving breaths of his lungs grew wilder. His heart must have been beating faster than ever before. I'm certain he sensed the end, painful, trapped, creaturely death. I placed that cage on the sidewalk, pushed the safety and opened the lever, then jumped back in anticipation. In my haste, I'd totally forgotten to aim the cage toward the park, as I was supposed to do. Instead, the open door was thrown toward the street and the houses across from the park. The scroll ran out, kept running. He ran across the road, up the stairs of a brick house, the now released squirrel stopped for a moment before some grocery bags that were propped open a screen door. He darted right in the front entrance of the house. In pure, stunned amazement, Dad and I stood both there, staring. Dad motioned me back to the truck. In the fucking car. So like 
how could she write a story about a dishwasher without knowing what a ramming is? Um, so I think that's that's part of it. You just have to know the job so well to write about it. it, it it's interesting to carry uh, the way question is phrased because I think for me, I've written two books in which characters have jobs that are not strictly they're they're told in a stylized way and they're not necessarily jobs that necessarily exist. Um, <clears throat> my second novel is a little bit different. And I think trying to think about why at least personally I haven't done I haven't written more about work. I think some of it is I have not worked many jobs that are terribly that lend themselves well to interesting stories. Um, in in uh, excerpt uh, it's, it's, you know if I had if I had uh, experience best control that it might be very different. Um, and I think for me it's also, and I suspect I'm not the only writer who feels that way, like for a long time there was a tension between the work that I did and the creative work that I did. I, I know a number of writers who have day jobs where their creative pursuits are, you know, encouraged and, you know, approved of and everything else. And I have, for me, there's always been a tension. I, I understand that there are people who have this kind of work uh, and do it and make a living from it and have this balance in their lives. And I've never had that, and so I think for me, there's always been a little bit of a, a bristling because, like, I kind of view that. And so it's just again that, like, a lot of a lot of my jobs that are not working have just involved like staring at a computer screen and, and poking at numbers. Um, Although I think so, I think that can be sort of like I don't think there's a, a way to do that as an interesting thing, but I do think like this is not a book, obviously, but I keep thinking about the show Severance, which I think mm -hmm. riffs on that in a way that is very interesting and also kind of turns the the more bizarre aspect of, of staring at numbers on a computer all day and turns it into something that is like much more interesting than just if all those characters were just doing spreadsheets all day. I've got a funny one to tell you at some point about public work experience because I'll be honest, I, I, I was a, in between stuff that I was doing and where I wound up, I, I was a medical textbook editor and I would have taken exterminating over a medical textbook editor. Um, it was the worst job I've ever had, period. Uh, <laughs> I lasted six weeks. Uh, I was like, I'll get out of here now. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you that story. Um, for, I think for me, writing the story, I mean, I, my, I segue in a, in a weird way through higher ed. I, I was a Melville and Whitman scholar. Mm -hmm. And I really struggled with writing this book for a long time. I didn't know how to tell the story. I didn't tell anyone at one point in grad school. I just I was at Brooklyn College and I was like, I mentioned it, I talk about it. I just was kind of like, it's part of my life that's over. And but it stuck with me. You know, like I kept coming back to saying, like, it's something I've got to grapple with. It is different. Like New York City doing experimenting in that in that environment is not a story that is it's not common. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was embarrassed, I've got to admit. I mean, if I was embarrassed in college, I was embarrassed in grad school, I was like, I want to forget it. Uh, I was one of those people who just was like, that's a, that's a different world. Um, so it really took me the courage to kind of, and, and at, at least two attempts, because at the first time I attempted this book, I tried an experimental version of it, mm. and it just did not work. Uh, you know, my friends who read it were like, it's just too conceptual. Um, the story, like, yeah, you got five characters. The work is about, it's about these two guys going out and doing the work, now this family dynamics, and like, you know, so cutting that out and getting to the real work was really hard for me. But once I could figure out, like, it's about them just going out into this underbelly that people don't see a lot of, uh, it really clarified the process for me a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. Okay, um, it's interesting, I, because I know we're dealing with, like, Yours is a great live, right? In, in Eastern Major, and, 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 and yours is like, you know, this quasi, you know, like speculative I understand what you're saying, but like actually having that clean separation. Um, I mean, yeah, and, and in a way, my question was, I was sort of like, is there a way to, to, to you know, which is a question I had much later on, but like, you know, it was kind of like, is there a way to dramatize the office? Is there is there a way, as we all move, you know, I'm not saying all, but like many people move your remote work and less interaction with jobs, like, it, like how how are, I mean, is that something that you have conceived of, written about, like thought you know, thought about again it's much later, but I'm kind of just like interested in like you know the nature of work that um, shape you know what we're doing. 
Yeah, that's interesting too, because I feel like there are. Well, I think I think part of writing about a job is like, like, do you want? Is it a job that you want to escape, or is it a job that like? Because I've had a few jobs that I probably would never write about because I want to write something where I I'm getting as far away from that as possible. Yeah. Um, whereas like a food truck, or even a food truck was actually fun, so that's easier to write about. Yeah, I think for in a lot of cases, writing about work is less writing about the the specific the specifics of the work and more about trying to find a way that that made me feel and sort of to find some some way to approach that. Uh, there's a character in my in my second novel who is probably one of the more autobiographical characters I've ever written, and they at one point had I worked in a sort of late 90s dot com. It was my first job out of college because I, mm. I graduated with a degree in film and realized I did not want to work in the film industry and then it was kind of like, well, what else is there? It's like, well, there's all these dot coms. You could go there and look at numbers. And I did that for a little while. And like, there's a little bit of a riff on that in, in, in X members. Uh, but it's less, I mean, also that work was just incredibly boring. And like, it was just like, mm -hmm. somebody like, hey, give me a number. And it's like, Here's a number. It's like that there's not, but writing for a company that was slowly coming apart like that, I can kind of like I can kind of convey that a little bit more. And like in the broader strokes, that's kind of more what I what I wanted to focus on mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. I, I would love now you know now that I have the chance, I would love to talk about my my small that's escaping the cubicle story because you know yeah. when I came out of college, I, I got my you know my at that point you know my $50,000, I've made it, <laughs> this is it, uh, I'm going to work in Midtown Manhattan and that's all's good. Mom and Dad are thrilled, Dad's like, you know, there's always work on the weekend, and I'm like, <laughs> no, no, good. Um, and I get this job and I'm sitting in a cubicle with, um, uh, I'll just tell you the, the, the comedy of it, like some of these people I never saw, right? we never interacted. There was one guy, there's a story I have in my head called Jeff Hayes, Sales. Right, and, and at like 11 a.m. every freaking day, at 11 a.m., Jeff Hayes gets Jeff Hayes sales, and you hear, Misty, no, calm down, tell, tell me, you did, uh, with, with, with him, where, where are you? No, and I'm like, this is every day there's something like this, and I'm like, where am I? Where did I wind up here? Yeah. And this, then I would be like, I'd be the guy who'd be like, all right, I got 45 minutes for lunch. Is anyone gonna miss me? I'll just keep walking the block. I'll just go like five blocks further. I'll just fall into the sea of humanity. And after a while, like you know, you talk to your parents and they're like, just get out. So I go to this guy. I go to my boss, Dave. This guy with like these weird, bizarre striped sweaters. It's like you know, this small guy, and he's like, and I'm like, I, I think I. I'm going to go to grad school. And he said, you look at me right now. You will never work in publishing again. And I went, yeah, I know. And he goes, look at this office. Just look at this. It was a closet without windows. He goes, this could be yours in 15 years. And I was like, ah. <laughs> oh, I don't want it. I was like, yeah, all right. Just, I, I'll take it. I'll never work again. Um, it was the smartest thing ever. It was like the and, and I you know as a college graduate I thought I had made it I was like wow I made it I have a job and just took the risk to go back to graduate school escaped <laughs> yeah, the, the graduate school escape I think many people yes. this things aren't working we're going to yeah, graduate school working um, okay so the reverse of the first question is originally what I was going to do is like um, you know what what's the fun or release of writing about a job excluding the challenges what do you think by writing about work what kind of space does it open up you know if, if, if the first question is about not writing about it. What does it open up? What's either exciting about it, you know, interesting about it? Um, obviously there is a level of, do you feel like uh, it's, it's, it's for fun, it's for interaction, is it, is it conceptual, you know, are, are you making a critique on society, you know, like what, what, are you, what are you doing when you're writing about work, at each of you kind of individually? Yeah, part of it, I mean, it, it's just, a lot of it for me actually is those small details that like no one, no one else would know unless they're in that job. Um, that's been a lot of fun, it was a lot of fun reading your book too. About because I didn't know that. I thought you were drunk saying that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
But yeah, yeah, I was reading about like exterminators and like um, I think the one thing that struck me the most actually was that these characters like don't hate the animals that are exterminating. Like I thought it would just be like completely like cruel to you, like um, but people so I mean there are these details that I think like mm -hmm. not for one thing they tell a lot about the character. It's like easy characterization to like show how someone handles their job. Um, also, I think like it's easy to put intention and conflict in a job because that's always there, whether it's like internal where you hate your job or external where there's like a shitty customer or something out there. Um, that makes it easy. So it, it kind of like, a lot of times when we write about work, it's like it gives me some guidelines to follow mm -hmm. and um, gives me like some great opportunities when I'm like running out of uh, running out of energy, but when the story starts to flag a little bit, I'm like, what's a good work story that I have um, that can kind of jumpstart a new idea? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, writing about work, I mean, it's a, you get interesting power dynamics at play often. Mm -hmm. um, you get interesting hierarchies, you get interesting, you can kind of play with and, uh, the way that a character views themselves versus the way that they are around other people. Um, you know, I think everything that I write ends up being a map of my own anxieties and preoccupations, and I think that's something as I've gotten older, something that I start to realize is like the gulf sometimes between the the me, the version of me that lives in my own head, and the version of me that I can kind of see coming out when like. It's like, oh, I really want to, you know, I crave approval and this and this, and like, well, how does that play out in the workplace setting? And like, how can I turn that idea into the stuff of, of some sort of drama, or, or in some cases, the stuff of comedy? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's kind of where, that's how that manifests for me. But also just sometimes there are, there are little bits and pieces, little moments that'll, that'll I'll pick up uh, and, there's a, there is in fact a, a little moment in, in the new book that is a, there is a character who says to the protagonist, quick like a bunny, and that first job I had out of college, there was one person who would send me requests for data who would say periodically, quick like a bunny, and it, and it drove me absolutely <laughs> insane. I hated it so much. And it's just like, well, finally I can, you know, yeah. this, this person is almost certainly Maybe, maybe they are. And maybe they'll just be like, you know, I haven't seen you in 20 odd years, but I read your book, and I, I call bullshit on you. This was very rude, and uh, you'll be hearing from my lawyers very soon. <laughs> I have trademarked quick like a bunny, and you, you sir, you yeah. sir, have, have defiled that trademark. <laughs> Probably not. I think for me, writing about it was, you know, part of, you know, mine was a father and son story of how not to work, to be honest with mm. you. My father was, you know, they, not to too much away, but there's a, there's a huge family drama that goes down where his, his business partner, which was kind of actual uh, life, screwed him and then committed suicide by, by driving into the back of the truck. And my father was like a road rageaholic in New York City. Like, he was seven days a week, he wouldn't give up, and he was just a live wire. Mm -hmm. And half of the book was trying to figure out, like, what the hell, like, when people talk about, like, and I'm like, at first you're like, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> like, what am I doing? And part of it was his weird way of saying, don't do this, like, don't do it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it was us figuring out how to work together as father and son, like what not to do and what to kind of, what to realize as you were going through, you know, this to get things right, even though your brain might be elsewhere, like, you, we got to bring you back. And the writing of it brought me back to, you know, kind of an area of my life that, that in certain cases, I wanted to forget, mm -hmm. but I wanted to move on from. Uh, but it was really valuable going back and being able to kind of get the, the work scenarios, the ones that were really vivid down on the page, to see how we interacted. And some of it, you know, if you read it, some of it's hilarious, and some of it is life and death. You know, it's it's about the nastiest things you can imagine. It's about, you know, it's about racism. It's about it's about class distinctions. It's about
about all these things, pecking order, that kind of work that way through. And, you know, even as a young kid, you don't know how to process them, but you feel them. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you've kind of started to answer this, but like, you know, how has, uh, uh, you know, real, your real life experiences played in each of your, you know, do you find yourself, uh, the question in some ways is like, do you find yourself embellishing on stories? Or like, maybe you just said, like, you just kind of borrow a story, like, do you find yourself being like, this might make a good story at work, or is it, is it, you know, the process of years later pulling back um, and being, you know, how, how much embellishment, how much real life are you thinking about it? Huh, yeah, I, I don't think, I think I pull stuff back from, like, the past. Um, I know, like, if, if I thought about what I've been doing, like, I work at a beer and wine store, mm -hmm. so I do have a lot of, like, interesting customers and experiences. I think some of them would end up in my fiction in the future, but they haven't yet. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I think most of it's just like, uh, originally with this book, actually, I was going to have each, before I even imagined this book, I was just going to write different stories about work, about different jobs that I mm -hmm. had, kind of to, really just for myself, to like wrap my head around these weird jobs that I've had. Um, because I don't think I hadn't held a job for more than a couple of years for like all of my 18s and 20s. Um, and they were mostly kind of crappy jobs. So yeah, I think um, that, that was a good way to start. It really actually got me into writing the story to like be like, who was I when I worked this mm -hmm. job? And why was that? And then those little anecdotes that like I had probably told my partner at the time or like, um, or a friend and been like, this was crazy, this happened. Um, and I probably embellished those then, actually, and right then yeah, and so embellished them now. Uh, I was thinking about that, actually, a lot too, recently, um, like that movie Big Fish, where the dad has mm -hmm. told his son all these greatly embellished stories, and like, how often, not to like change the subject, but uh, mm -hmm. how often like stories about work get embellished anyways, just in the telling of them, like, you know, the crazy screaming drunk I was like seven feet tall, not like mm -hmm. five five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of thing. So it's I think they always will be embellished, at least in my writing. Yeah. But they've already been embellished in real life. Yeah. 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 There's a there was a point about nine or ten years ago when I quit my last job in an office to go freelance writing full to do freelance writing full time. Um, and it's, it's interesting to look back at writing about jobs before then and then now because I don't really want to write about other writers because it kind of, unless I'm, unless I'm doing it in a very certain way, it can turn into a cliche uh, very quickly. But there are definitely things that, like, because the, the freelance writing I do tends to be about different things, and so there will be things that I will pick up from doing that, where sometimes I'll file something away like, oh, that's an interesting thing happening with food, or with cars, or with history, and like I'll kind of file it away in the back of my brain. At the same time, it's, it's, it's a little interesting because I do think about when I was a, this is, this, uh, this is going to sound hard, when I was a younger writer, I, uh, I do think I drew on, I think some of the first stories where I kind of found my voice were, there was one, there, like the first story that I ever had published anywhere was not really based on the job I had, but based on, I worked uh, on a film shoot one summer when I was in college, uh, and my job was doing craft service on a very low budget independent film, and so my experience, I would be generally at like all night grocery stores, at like two in the morning buying stuff for the next day. And like, I ended up drawing on that, ex that experience, which kind of is an outgrowth of that. Uh, and there was a, the first novel I finished, which has never been published and probably won't ever be, I think was also a little bit more, was also a little bit more, I think, drawing on some very bad office experiences that I had. Um, one of which was especially just, uh, like, well, it would, it would be, it, it would involve, the setup for it would involve like five or ten minutes of, of me yammering and then that would just kind of lose the point. But like, and I think to some extent, because I had put that into a, a book and it hadn't, it hadn't been a book that worked, I kind of wanted to 
to avoid it and that was the next thing. And then just, that was a lot of experience and yeah. And like, yeah. There, and there's not really a lot of, and again, the, the bad things in a lot of ways were bad in a way that is not terribly profound or interesting. It was just mm -hmm. like, I worked with people who were kind of shitty or like, this was a badly run organization or whatever else, but like not in like a cathartically interesting or surreal or whatever way. It was just like, yeah, this is just kind of banal, which is, you know, and, and I think there's a way to kind of write banality into a book and make it interesting, but I have not yet cracked that code. You read The Long Cut by Emily Hall? No, I've, I'm, I'm familiar with it. It's a weird book about work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with this one, I definitely there were definitely things that I had to like compress in time and things mm -hmm. and just cut around. You know, like it, I, I realized that I, when I read Toby's Road novel, I realized I, I couldn't. I, I had tried to write a series of things about the characters on the road, but I couldn't do it. Like, mm -hmm. it just, you know, it just didn't it didn't ring true for me. And, and with these two characters, I had to like every time I moved them out of New York City, people were like. Uh, um, I can tell you the one that I'm, I'm looking forward to. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I, you know, I, I, I finished to run it in higher ed, and I can't wait to write it about them. <laughs> like I just, it, it's as many of you know, it's hilarious, tragic, and all of the above in, in, in a couple of weeks' time. So uh, I'm, I'm curious how I'm going to approach that, uh, and delicately, of course, too, because still a lot of friends, but still a lot of friends who are like. Can't take a step back and see what's going on with, with this. So, uh, but uh, I, I think I have to, be in, in a way, like like so many other writers approaching higher ed, I have to do it with a kind of darker sense of humor. That's that's, that's what comes to mind. Yeah, I will do that. Um, I, I feel like you know you guys have kind of gotten into this, but like, and, and this is maybe an interesting question for, for writers because I think we're, uh, unless you're doing writing full time, you're often thinking about a lot of the other stuff aside. But like, how do you think about the, the nature of work and meaning? That like some people think of it as like a bullshit job and other people like actually derive meaning from it. Like, how do your characters play that out? How are you thinking about it as a writer? Um, yeah. Huh. So, so like I'm working a job that I think a lot of people would see as a bullshit job, but I actually find a lot of meaning in it. Um, so I, I mean, and, that, and that's something too that like, I think I like cracked the code on working bullshit jobs where I like am able to find meaning in a lot of bullshit jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of that comes for me, like looking back at the job. Like when I worked at Circle K for three years, I worked night shifts. It was awful. But looking back, I I can find a lot of meaning in it. Um, whereas then, like I, I think about like when I finished grad school, I wanted to teach, and I thought this is the meaningful job. Mm -hmm. And then for me, that real that job just kind of fell flat for me. I, like I like teaching classes here every once in a while, but like. Being a college professor really did not do it for me at all. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't know. I think I think like, for, to me, like no, there's no bullshit job out there. Like I think any yeah. job you could find meaning in. Um, and I think about like the, what you were talking about, like just like typing in numbers on your computer. Like maybe the meaning is that like you're losing your mind. Like, <laughs> <laughs> You know, maybe the meaning is something else, but I think there, there's probably a way into writing about any job, um, just because that's so much of. Well, I think in, in his essay, the person who says like we spend most of our lives working a job, and that that's like most of our waking hours sometimes uh, for many of us. So like, if it's not meaningful, it's crushing us, and that's a story. If it is meaningful to you, that's a different. It's like creating you. Um, Energizing you, so that's another story. Yeah, the Pale King, the Foster Walls. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, yeah, I think again for me, kind of what what draws me in is a little bit more of like the conflicts that can emerge from work rather than within work. Yeah. But um, I'm gonna maybe I don't want to say cheat on this answer, but um, I also do a lot. A lot of my freelance work is writing about books, and I had a had an essay go up on the site of Reactor recently that was about sort of speculative workplace novels and mm -hmm. they I had gotten this there were like four books that had come out within about a year of each other uh, that we're all doing that we're all using um, <clears throat> different speculative devices to uh, to to riff on different things. Uh, like there's um, Michael Cisco who had a book called 
pest in which this uh, engineer, a structural engineer is hired on this great job, on this job that sounds fantastic and soon spirals out of control and it's sort of this very surreal take on, uh, you know, you've been offered your dream job and it just goes absolutely terribly and he ends up in uh, the body of the yak. Uh, and I don't know if anybody else here has read Molly McGee's book, Jonathan Abernathy, You Were Kind, uh, which is just absolutely fantastic book about someone who is deeply, has lots of student loan debt and ends up getting a job where he is essentially going into the dreams of American workers to make them more productive and like get rid of all of their bad thoughts. Uh, and it's also written in such a way where it's like it's a very surreal book, so you're like, is this actually happening or is this man just having a series of stress dreams in which this is going in? It's, it's just, I think, a really, really evocative look at that. And like, it's, it can also be, it's also inspiring to see for me, like, doing a piece like that or you know, this panel and kind of seeing the radically different ways in which uh, you yeah. can write about work. Yeah. I'm totally, for me right now, I'm at a total crossroads for me. So I, I, I was in the higher ed, I was in St. Francis, St. Francis College for 27 years, but I was teaching developmental composition, creative writing, literature, you name it. I was in the, the dean's office twice. And now at the stage where I, I, I came to the point where I'm like, I think it's I think I'm burnt out, like I'm done, like I, I'm finished. And I, I'm at that place where I'm figuring out what's next. Mm -hmm. And so my work has been parenting and writing. Mm -hmm. And there are days where it's like, oh, it's just this, get up, do this, and then there are days like last week where I'm like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> like, where am I going next? And my wife is like, go back and keep writing. And I'm like, that's, that's what I'm doing. Right? That's what I'm doing. And but like it is like that muscle memory, even from like going in and doing, you know, your 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 three classes, getting the prep, getting the getting ready for the drama, like. The, the, the thing that I can't tune out to yet is like all of the people who are like continually keeping me in the faculty and administrative drama. I'm like, guys, I'm not in it anymore. And they're like, no, 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 but we just gotta, we gotta tell you this. And I'm like, I don't know anymore. Why don't you want to something else? Uh, but I'm so curious to see what it's gonna be like. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to it. It's kind of like this now pivot zone for me uh, where I get to reimagine what work is. I mean, work is so fascinating because you have this intensely close relationships. So, like in a family, I know you can escape your family, but like, it's a little bit harder. But like work, you can be all involved in people's business, and then you can like leave, and then suddenly it's, it's like that whole like you know they can just disappear, like the whole superstructure, which I think is a very strange thing about about work that I've also had to experience in my life. Just in a way, yeah, yeah, just strange. Um, according to the um, uh, thing you gave me, um, I just to ask the audience if you guys have any questions that you would like to ask the panelists. Yeah. Okay, so you talked about working in, in different jobs and in, in the parenting as, as your day to day. When you're writing about the quotidian, mm -hmm. does it, it, where do you, how do you deal with, for example, not um, getting too navel gazy about the minutia of the job mm -hmm. and making it interesting for the reader to just, to, to make it a story as opposed to, I did this and then I did this. That was, hitting, that was hitting inside my first question. I was like, work can be so boring. <laughs> you know, it like, yeah, you're right. I can break through it. We spend most of our day right. working or yeah. sleeping, so. Right. So, yeah. How do we buy that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, part of it was getting a good editor thing. <laughs> he definitely cut out some parts that were just like, why? Like, it's like, why? I'm just talking about this because it was part of work. Um, but huh. yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like there is, there definitely is a limit of like how much you can actually talk about your work, and then how much you need to dive into. Well, I think you mentioned too, like the the, the person's response to the work is maybe more important too. Like, if it isn't, if the work right. isn't like um, making the story move forward, if it's not like something that's affecting the character in a certain way or showing revealing a an emotion from the character. Like, if the character isn't reacting to it, then it, I think it's too naval gazy, yeah, definitely. I, I mentioned a story about the dishwasher that figures out what a ramekin is, and like, it, that always just sticks out to me. It's like, okay, so that's like this little bit of thing, this one little thing where like, maybe you're teaching the reader a little bit, but it's also the character that 
this discovery, this like this little bit of minutia and like making it something big, like it's a big deal to him. Um, so I think it can be, yeah, I think basically if it's like something that's revealing more about the character or forcing the character to do something, to, to make a decision. I, I would say, and this is not something, this is actually, I, I'm thinking through this kind of out loud, so apologies if I ramble a little bit. But I think there's also, sometimes there can be a, the, the importance of, of incorporating the structure, taking risks with the structure of the project. Um, this is a this is a weird example, but I don't know if anybody else here is a David Peace reader. Um, he had a book come out a few years ago called Red or Dead, which was uh, about the longtime coach of the soccer team Liverpool uh, FC, and it is 800 pages long. And there are times where David Peace just uses the first two thirds of the book are basically like this guy getting his start as a coach, and like these like 10 years where he was basically just like the best in his job, and there's just this incredible use of repetition, and like just the same phrases used again and again, and you get, and like, at first you're just like, Jesus, this is, there's so much of it. But then after you've been reading it for hundreds of pages, you are, you get it, and you're just like, oh yeah, this is, this is how he's doing it. He's evoking what it's like to be coaching his teams, and what it's like to be watching everything play out, because then it's not just about this, because then about uh, two thirds of the way through, uh, Bill, Bill Shankly, this guy who long time coach in Liverpool, basically at the top of his game just said like, you know what, I've, I've done everything I set out to do, I'm, I'm, done. I'm retiring, you know, it's been, it's been a joy doing this. And the last part of the book is essentially wrestling with, it's, it's David Peace using the same way that he would describe like, Liverpool playing at the highest levels of the sport, but it's like Bill Shankly going outside and washing his car and right? going through all of these like these quotidian routines that have replaced this incredibly high profile job. And it's fascinating because it's like, oh my god, and it's like this would also not work mm -hmm. if he had not taken hundreds and hundreds of pages to do it. And like I have no idea if that is a lesson I will ever be able to apply to my work, but it was fascinating to see just how he did that. And just like how he took this to my mind, the incredible risk of just like making this book borderline unreadable, and it just paid off so, so much at the end, where you're just like, oh my god, he's, he's washing his car for five pages, but oh my god, this is just like the stuff of high drama, it's so good. Uh, so yeah. and borderline unreadable is the most terrifying thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's bizarre, but it's also like, I'm reading this from like, I, I, I am a, my English team is done in Hotspur, like, I don't, I don't have strong pro or con feelings, but, but like, I'm reading this book, and I'm like, oh my god, Liverpool's gonna do it, they're gonna win, and I'm like, wait, I don't, I'm not emotionally invested in Liverpool, but I am! But yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> so. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's really difficult, because I think at a certain point, like, the minutia of a job, like, getting into the really nitty-gritty details of it, can provide someone with, like, that moment of, like, Oh, that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. But then, my God, like, there's a certain point where you realize you could go overboard, yeah. and you know, as he said, a good editor will be like, "We got it, get it, right? I know now how to do a freaking termite job. Like, I get it. Oh, no, no, no. Like, we drilled with you, man. Um, yeah, I think for for it's it's. But I, I do agree too about the, the character and what what it does with the character. If if it is driving the story forward. And it is showing the complexity as you go down deeper that the relationship is unfolding. That's what makes a difference. Uh, but it's such a it's, it is a really fine line about how much because we're all craving to know more about how these two people work. But then at the same time, we also don't want like I don't know if I could go you know ten pages with you know how we're going to get that bat out of the attic successfully. Like that might be too much tedium. Uh, so it's it's a it's a really fine line. But I think our, you know. All of it is development of the story and how those, the, the central two, for me, the central two characters either diverge or come back together. Thank you. Can I follow up on that? Did you get the injured squirrel or did it not matter to the end of the story? It went right into someone else's house. <laughs> and we just sat there, helpless, looked over and went, 
down to the end of the story, so yeah. you didn't follow up. Yeah. So the reader knows. Uh, yeah, no, we, we just we kind of we, we kind of left it there. Part of it part of it was my dad telling me you you are not paying attention and you're dangerous and that's that's what you do often when you're out on the road with me. And yes, that's what I that's what I'd be doing all the time. Um, like my, my favorite story, one of my favorite stories now is just God, God's truth. We did the we did the, the barns, right? In you know, like in Africa, Belmont horse barns, which are disgusting in a certain way because you're dealing with rats. And I was a kid, and I was like, I'm not wearing jeans. I'm not wearing jeans. It's, it's 102 degrees, and he's just like, wear jeans, and I'm like. Ooh. You want to see like terror, like what did I do to myself? Um, I mean, a lot of a lot of my novel was about those kind of, and, and part of it, not actually, I'll say, is mm -hmm. that he was doing it, so I would I would think about something else. I would go to college. I would be a writer. I would do something else, and that was part of the the gimmick. Like in in many ways, it was an extreme form of tough love, but that was the goal. It was like if you see this and do this, you will not choose to do this. It's very like a character, yeah, like a uh, char character in, in, in this way. I, I mean, I was thinking about like, you know, um, so I we're talking about yeah, re reproducing and kind of relates to the honest question. And I'm thinking, yeah, I am thinking of the Pale King, I'm like, all's long time. And I realize they're not here, but they're both books that try to reproduce kind of what it feels like, but they don't relent. They don't actually ever leave it or a questionable shape by Bennett Simmons when his job is to go out and hunt for the other guy's zombie dad. Like, all, all books that kind of like reproduce the quotidian. Um, and I think like there's a lot of pressure on. Your sentences, and, you know, in your case, you're saying like it eventually pays off with, with you know, like thematically. Um, but whether a reader, do you want to stay for those theater pages? Well, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, you that's, see if you lose right. the reader, right. it doesn't matter what you do in the end. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, in, in the case of that book, like this is a writer who I've read, like that was probably the seventh or eighth book of his I've read. Right. Like, I don't think, and I specifically said to people, like, if you want to read this guy, don't start with that. But, <laughs> but like, if, if you read a couple of other ones and you like it, then, then you know, you're probably, but you know, yeah. But I also, I also really love the Hell King, and I don't think it would not be my first David Foster Wallace no, no, no. book yeah. to recommend to, to someone. Yeah, Bad Foundations of Brian Allen Card is a similar speculative thing, um, you know, in the, midst, in the midst of work by, by taking it to another yeah. quantum realm, but then still reproducing work in, in that scene. So I don't know, it's, it's interesting. Writing about your work, did it change at all how you felt about it or thought about it afterward? I'll just keep jumping. I learned to appreciate it a lot more, I think. And maybe, it, I, you know, I, I, I probably wanted to tell that story uh, a decade ago and just didn't have the courage to do it or the wherewithal. And, you know, now looking back on it now, it was for a long time a period of my life where I just kind of was like, yeah, I did that. I was proud of it. Yeah, I, I was able to kind of say like I learned a lot. Of, I learned a lot about characters. I learned a lot about you know different people that we interacted with, mm -hmm. and then of course a lot about you know the creatures that we don't want to interact <laughs> with very much. And um, you know I, I, can, I can say I, I, I certainly learned to look back on it and appreciate the work out a lot more, especially like with other work that you kind of get thrown into, where like you know you're staring at, at data or reading spreadsheets all day or getting screamed at by you know, obnoxious doctors, and I was like, well, I'd have to be on the road sometimes, you know, or I, might, I don't know what I'm going to face, but, you know what, I, mean, I, I can still move from place to place to place, and, you know, I, I'd learn to appreciate it a lot more. Yeah, to me, it, yeah, it does feel more really fulfilling to me, actually, because yeah. it, it's easy to look at these, like, minimum wage jobs that I've had as, like, just a waste of time, and really they were at the time, I didn't know what I wanted, so I just, like, worked a job because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, so it does feel like now I'm turning it into something more, like I'm realizing like, well for one thing how it affected me earlier, which I didn't always have time to think about. Um, so, so it's almost like these big chunks of time that I wasted at work really not doing anything productive at all um, have become something productive and something that like has changed me more in retrospect. I think for me, it's less thinking about the, specific, the jobs themselves and more the people I worked with and kind of, you know, what what made 
some of them tick and what, what was going through their minds when, when I was going through this and like, you know, uh, how, how did that, how were they processing some of the same things I was processing and, and everything else. And like that, that for me, I think, you know, is really what interests me the most about revisiting those times. Um, the answer to the first question made me think about this. I think Nick was saying to write about a job, you have to really know that job. And so I was wondering, what is like the furthest outside of yourself that you've gone in your writing? Maybe a character who was just completely unlike yourself or people that you knew or worked a job that you had never worked. And what was that experience like trying to write that character? And do you feel like it was successful in your opinion? I'm trying. I'm sure there are other examples of it, but in my book, I have a story about a guy that, um, well, basically, a film crew comes to town and is filming a movie, which I didn't know a lot about. And I do have, I have a friend who, um, what was he? He was like a grip, I think, and. He had some comments on it, and like, it, I, was, I was not accurate, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, my story was not quite accurate. If you, if someone that's into making films, like, and knows about them read it, they would probably have more comments for me. And that was definitely, but that also took, like, a ton of research, too. Like, mm -hmm. I had to call people, I had to ask people questions about what it's actually like. Um, um, I, have, I have met a guy at a residency who does, like, locations for films and my experience, so I did have one experience where like a film was being made in my hometown and that was kind of what I was basing it off of. But then he was like, no, this is actually how it works. Like you only saw this tiny part of it. So um, yeah, that was way out of my realm of what I knew. Other than that, like I've written some like really speculative stuff where I made up like, you know, it's like a post-apocalyptic world and like these people are doing jobs that don't exist. So that was easy because like, no one's going to tell me I'm wrong because I made it up. Um, so that was easy. Yeah, I, I, a lot of my jobs have been on the more surreal side of uh, things. That said, like, I mean, there's a character in my second novel who is a recording engineer, which I think I just, I know, I know some recording engineers, so there was a little bit of like picking up like when I had been sitting in a control room and watching someone go through stuff and, you know, trying to just apply some of the stuff that I had you know, picked up during that time. Uh, and now, uh, yeah. I'm in the middle of it right now, so the, the next project I'm doing is kind of a detective story, and what, so what I did was, to the team, one of them is, is kind of loosely based on a, a, a Franciscan friar that I know, like I just, well, I know very well, so I've been really listening to him about his life. But as far as the, det the actual detective, I had to call friends. Like, and it was kind of like friend for friend, because I kind of didn't want an NYPD detective, who I knew a couple of those growing up, and I, I wanted a, a more private detective, and, and a, a particular type. So I kind of had to do a little, little, phone, little phone calls with occasionally people who I, I are very, very different from, <laughs> who I sometimes am terrified about. Um, but they, they've been paying off. I mean, even just like logistics of what a, like a, what a day looks like has really helped a lot. I mean, you know, I could, I could make it up, but I mean, on a, on a certain level, I just want to know, hey, what's what like, mm -hmm. so Wednesday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon look like? What are you typically doing? Just so I can, if I'm going really off, the, you know, like in a very different direction, I just wanted to get a baseline. And uh, it was nice being able to open up the, the Rolodex and find that. People were just, and most of the time, honestly, you know, like people are really, they love to talk about what they do. You know, mm -hmm. Most of the time. They love to share it, especially if you're going to do something with it. Or great, let's do something with it. Yeah. So, I actually have a question, and it may be informed by the fact that I've been on my work laptop um, during this talk, so mm -hmm. apologies. Um, but viewing work as like a system, kind of feeling chained to work. I'm curious, I don't know if this is a banal or even a cringy concept, but if you've encountered it in your reading, or even in writing groups, um, whether or not people personify work and the perspective of the story is actually from work, um, and that the character, like work drives the story. I'm just curious if that's ever come up, because sometimes it feels like 
we're part of, you know, like a cog and a system, and I feel like a story could be told from that perspective. So just curious. I mean, the two books that come to mind, like I said, Emily Hall's book and then Joshua Ferris's book. Um, not that the work is perspective, but they're both, they're, those books are both explicitly. What's the name of that book by Ferris? It's like a totally, wholly set at work, and, and, it's, and it goes through the different people, like middle management in the office. So it's not work's perspective, but it is a work book. It is about what you are like at work, and those people's lives are, you know, basically faced for the entire novel. Yeah. And then we can the end. Yes, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it? Then we can tune out. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say, like, thinking, uh, Sergio uh, was it the Naked Singularity? Which is is fascinating because it's about a very burned out public defender, and he, he, that is his job as well. Um, and that kind of like those books have a, just an incredibly lived in level of detail. Um, I also had one of the most embarrassing experiences of my life interviewing him once, where I did not have the microphone on my recorder plugged all the way in, and I had a really great conversation with him, and then. Listen to it, and it was just 35 minutes of stack. And I had to call him back. And like he was like, the only time I can talk to you is like 8:30 on Friday because I am a public defender and I am really busy during the week. And she's like, no, oh my god, I dropped the ball. It is so badly. Uh, he was very gracious, but yeah. Um, but I think just also a writer who does a fantastic job of like reckoning with the the ins and outs of what of, of and sort of turning the stuff of a job into plot that can sustain a very big, thoughtful, thematically rich book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm also like, because of the, the nature of work is changing and, and becoming both like, we're not there, but also weirdly really totalizing, like you, you can also always be at work. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think like, you probably will see people writing about it in a different way. I'm, I'm, yeah, I guess like, I, I maybe I'm going to encounter as much stuff as you know. A couple of years ago, um, maybe longer than a couple of years ago now, I think the Times Magazine read an excerpt from uh, Dave Eggers' The Circle, which I have not read. And part of it was that, like, this is a, this is going to sound like a backhand compliment. I've read other work of Eggers' which I really liked, but this, like, just really, really captured very well the sense of, like, a workplace that is very, that is very clearly, like, encroaching on its employees' lives, and, like, mm -hmm. it's just, like, there should be no work-life balance, like, or you have to have work-life balance on our terms. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh my god, oh my god, this is getting me hired. Like, you, you did too good a job, Dave Eggers. Mm -hmm. I'm scared to get away from your book. Um, sorry, Dave Eggers. <laughs> that was a good book. Right? Yeah. yeah. Which kind of actually makes me, when you said that, it made me think of like, um, so I'm writing about like a cult now, which is basically like the elimination of the word, but that one you live in one you Yeah. And so yeah, now I'm going to think about that one. Oh, I have actually talked about cults and talking about jobs. Job I, a job I worked for about three years in the early 2000s, um, we was an architectural light designer. There was an architect we were working with, and uh, there was this very lucrative looking job that we, we had been offered. And at some point, my boss was just like, you know what? I, I have a really bad feeling. I think this organization is a cult. <laughs> and I was actually kind of bummed because I was the, basically the office manager. And I was like, but this pays really well, and like we're losing money. And this, this. she's like, I think it's a cult. <laughs> and that turned out to be Nexium. Oh, wow. So, so my, my boss was absolutely 100% her instincts were just like, yep, cult. <laughs> we, should, we should not be associated with this in any way. And uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely the right call. <laughs> so. um, well, it's 8.15, I'm a professor, you know, for better or worse. So if we're perfectly on time, uh, you know, we're supposed to interact now with the audience and some books, but, you know, thank you to um, Nick and the Instagram bias for here and reading the books and talking about the Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you, the writer's center.